Okay, let's start slowly uh, this meetup. Okay. Um, all right, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Andrzej Kaminski, and I am co organizer of this meetup. And at the same time, today I am host of, of this event. Uh, before we start, however, I would like to ask you a favor. Um, so we would like to know, uh, I'll ask you a question, and we'd like to know a little bit more about where you are in your journey. What inspires you about DevOps? Um, you can use uh, uh, either your browser by and enter um, that menti.com um, address with that code that is actually on the screen, or you can scan the QR code um, on your phone or any any other way you can do it. And uh, um, our one of our speakers will talk a little bit uh, about this um, a little bit later because there might be a prize that you can win. All right. Okay. So let's start. Um, a, a couple of days ago, I was in a presentation and uh, it was a presentation about DevOps and legacy systems. And um, the presenter made a very interesting statement. What he said in old times, the times of mainframes, we all were DevOps. Now, over time, our systems became more complicated. So we introduced um, functional departments and over, over time, we created silos. Those silos started drifting further and further away. So we ended up with departments like development, operations, infrastructure, security, data, and largely they were operating independently. So this led to many inefficiencies. So if you think about this, uh, it, it's, it created handoffs, it created lost context, but also created a shift in the mindset. Like, you know, people start thinking, this is not my job. There's actually others department job. So with DevOps, we try to tr bring it back. Um, in mainframe world, the right thing was the mindset because we, all of us really at the same time, operated and developed the, the applications. But at the time, what was missing was automation, um, lean processes, uh, limiting work uh, or lean processes, like for example, limiting work in progress, um, small batches and visualization, but also lack of proper measurements and automated measurements and low ability to, uh, to, to have a low risk uh, deployments to production. So in today's event, we are going to have uh, several speakers uh, touching on some of those um, uh, on those subjects. So uh, um, before we start, a couple of items for housekeeping. Um, so first of all, this session is recorded. Um, I would like to ask you to mute your mic um, during the during the presentations. After each presentation, we'll have a ten minutes for questions and answers. Um, you can unmute your microphone then to ask those questions, or during the presentations, you can type those questions in the chat. Um, no, the idea is that we want to create uninterrupted flow for the uh, for the presenters. Um, so let me introduce our first speaker. So Pam Clavier is not really new to this event. She presented in this forum already a couple of times. Um, believe or not, but Pam spent over 21 years in IT. And she was working for international cross-industry management consulting firms. And currently she's working with IT leadership as an Agile DevOps program manager to transform organizational delivery model. The topic she's going to introduce is the convergence of DevOps, what inspired the DevOps movement, and why should I care? Please welcome Pam. Pam, over to you. Thanks so much, Andre. Fantastic. I'm going to share a screen. So let's have a look at that. And fantastic. So you should be seeing a PowerPoint screen, if you could just give me a thumbs up. Yes. Okay, fantastic. So if you haven't already, and I see a lot of you have, um, please participate in the quick menti poll, either using the quick response code or typing in the code. And we will show the results of this um, sometime in between the next presentation. So thanks very much to those who've already responded. We'd love to hear where are you on your journey and also what inspires you about DevOps? And, uh, surely by the fact that you're here and attending tells me that you're inspired by DevOps. So I'm going to be talking to you today about the convergence of DevOps. And I'm going to start by asking you two questions. And we're going to revisit this. We want to make sure that we answer these questions for you. 
but what do you know about what inspired the DevOps movement? And secondly, do you care? So I hope to, in the next couple of minutes, convince you that you do care. Thanks, Andre, for the introduction. I um, just put out my LinkedIn um, ID over here. I'd love to connect with those of you I don't already know. And I see a lot of familiar names, a lot of familiar faces. So it's really nice to see everyone again. And I'd love to connect with you um, about Agile, DevOps, or collaborating on research. And hopefully you recognize that this is a picture of a Shetland sheepdog, my dog, and not my picture. Um, so I'd love to connect with you even about Shelton's. Um, and I'm offering you a discount in exchange for a few minutes of your time to complete a survey. And I'll put this link in the chat as well. Um, if you just go in, it'll take you about five, 10 minutes to complete a survey, maybe not even that long. Um, and you could qualify, well, you will qualify if you complete the survey for a, for a discount on some training from T-Shape uh, Unlimited. So let's get started. So today we've got an array of DevOps variations. I'm going to call out a few examples. Um, AI ops, combining big data and machine learning to automate ops processes for anomaly detection and causality. NetOps, achieving agility in operations without sacrificing availability. And then on the far end of the scale, it scares a lot of people, no ops, when IT operations are completely automated, as is the dream, um, though, of course, not eliminated. The public report of 2019 states that today, security is really considered to be part of DevOps. So the term DevSecOps is now redundant. I just saw the other day an invitation to a DevSecOps conference. So it seems like the industry is still in a little bit of a quandary about that one. Whatever it is, it seems it's really clear is that everyone wants to get into, into DevOps. And even thanks to cloud costing models, even finance wants to get into DevOps. Um, people are wanting to break the barriers and get into IT with operations. But why? What inspired the DevOps movement? Where did this come from? DevOps is a culmination of amazing and significant movements and events. But don't believe me, um, so said John Willis of the Phoenix Project and the DevOps Handbook. He said this already in 2012. Let's take a look at the movements and the events. All right, we can go way back in time. And we're starting with Toyota Production System, one of the most significant movements of DevOps, where Toyota Production System introduced Kaizen, continuous improvement, already in the late 1940s. A fun exercise that I came across while uh, putting this together is to look up the Toyota slogans. Did you know that these change every couple of years and differ by country? So growing up in South Africa, the slogan I remember was, everything keeps going right, Toyota. And I really love that from a DevOps quality perspective. Toyota production system was really into DevOps already at that time. Uh, there's another slogan that stands out for me, which is, uh, you asked for it, you got it. If you can think of slogans from where you grew up, whether it's Canada or wherever around the world, um, type it into the chat, it'll be fun to see. Moving forward on our timeline, um, systems thinking through Jay Forrester in 1956, and learnings from the Toyota production system codified and documented as lean in 1992. That took quite a while from the late 1940s to lean in 1992. And then of course, agile, which we all know, happened in 2001. A couple of other interesting and significant events for DevOps is where did these jobs first emerge? Or where did these concepts first emerge? So the first DevOps jobs, the first, well, the first developer jobs, way back in 1957, the first computer programmers write code using Fortran. Network engineering comes about in 1969 as ARPANET launches, creating the first network, network engineering jobs and network operation centers. We scoot on ahead to 2003, the concept of the site reliability engineer emerges. And then of course, we have to mention the deployment pipeline. And if you'll notice in Willie's background, he's got a lot of pipelines. So um, DevOps is a lot about the pipelines. The first concept of the deployment pipeline came around in 2006. But the DevOps movement really started to coalesce around 2007, 2008. Why? Discontent coupled with a passion for change 
reached a tipping point. The development and operations communities wanted to do something about their concern. So what were they concerned about? Well, there was a fatal level of dysfunction in the industry. And more about that in an upcoming story. Let's finish our timeline first. 2008, Patrick Dubois and Andrew Schaffer applied agile principles to infrastructure, not just application code, at the Birds of a Feather talk at a Toronto conference. A key moment, even though, guess what? There were only two who attended this session. Luckily, they've gathered quite a lot more to their flock since then. 2009, Flickr did the impossible. They boasted 10 deployments per day. A big year in 2009 for DevOps. The first DevOps days held in, in Belgium. And Patrick Dubois, remember from Birds of a Feather, credited for coining the word DevOps. So DevOps actually emerges as a term at this stage. 2012, we've already started to look at the state of it and measure it, and the first state of DevOps report comes out. 2017, just 10 years after the movement started to coalesce, Forrester Research calls 2017 the year of DevOps, where 50% of organizations are, according to Forrester Research, implementing DevOps. And where does that leave us today? So today, DevOps is well underway, but there is still resistance. Uh, today, it's not just the heavy hitters like Amazon, Facebook, Netflix, and Walmart doing DevOps. Among those joining them, joining them are Disney, BMW, Starbucks, Adidas, Capital One, and of course, whatever company you're working for if you're here and doing DevOps. But we're not at a state of done, we're on a journey. There is still some resistance and continuous improvement and expansion, of course. We never actually done, but we're on that journey. But I promise to inspire you, or I promise to try to inspire you. So a bit of history doesn't really do it. Let's look at it in more of a story. The timeline doesn't tell you the passionate story of the discontent and revolution. And I did promise you that I'd try and convince you why, should, why you should care about what inspired DevOps. So let's give this part a go. So once upon a time, it all starts with the traditional approach. We know how this goes, design, build, test, release, support. And of course, it starts off with design. We know our clients, they know exactly what they want, requirements get approved, and then weeks, months, or even years later, they get exactly what they wanted. It's amazing, the solution is bag free, easily supported, a smooth handover takes place from release to support. And we all know this feeling, IT triumph. But wait a second, is that reality? When this type of IT triumph takes place in complex domains with high rates of change, it usually comes at a great cost. And it goes a little bit like this, unfortunately. Now, this is the dysfunction that Dev and Ops communities started the resistance about. Early commitment leads to high risk. Lack of flexibility, we're signing off requirements at the point we know the least, predicting the future. It leads to costly changes. Executive made deadlines are based on wanting to make sure people are working or on pleasing their bosses rather than on empirical data. It leads to broken promises, overtime, burnout, turnover. Of course, to meet these deadlines, we then cut corners and this results in technical debt. And a culture of blame results from the silos and the handovers. I think Andre opened with talking about the silos and the handovers that have been created. And uh, people are saying, it's not my problem. How many times have we heard people say, oh, but it, it works on my machine. But that's not all. There's even more pressure on IT. Additional pressures. We live in a VUCA world. So never mind just IT teams being agile. Organizations are feeling the pressure to become um, agile, enterprise agility, and to thrive in today's increasing volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Complification. This actually ties in with exactly what Andre was talking about at the beginning of uh, the meetup. Um, we have this heightened need for collaboration because of our increased complexity and the specialization that's occurred. These micro specializations and working in silos where we've got these micro specializations and everyone's got a really niche specialization. And complification, I promise, it is a word, 
It's originally published in France in 1985 to describe the, con the consequences of complexity in economics. Microservices. So while we welcome technical advances uh, like cloud computing, software as a service, uh, these have led to microservices. And the complication that that adds or the pressure that that adds is that um, these technical advances lead to the heightened need for collaboration with operations. Without that, uh, without that collaboration, uh, we're, we're not going to function that well. Uh, the operations role is no longer a plain system admin role. And of course, there's us, the rise of the knowledge worker. We're people paid to think for a living. We're motivated differently than before. Now we're motivated by purpose, autonomy, mastery. And with a new mindset, we recognize that there's a better way. A paradigm shift is definitely needed. So you'll recognize Dave Snowden's Kinevan uh, diagram, problem solving and sense making framework. And it tells us that if we try to solve our complex problems in the obvious zone on the bottom right, uh, best practice becomes past practice. It no longer helps us. Instead, it's holding us back. Kinevan studies prove that applying yesterday's logic to today's complex problems it actually lands us in the chaotic domain. And without knowing which domain you're in before you actually apply a solution or question things, it actually results in disorder. So today we realize that we need a paradigm shift. We can't rely on best practice. This is past practice. We need a paradigm shift to try and solve the problems. And I mentioned I'm telling you a story. So enter our first hero story, Agile. So Agile says, enough, let's draw the line. Uh, we're all familiar with, this, uh, with the Agile story. 20 been around the block, software engineers, needed a ski resort. The result is the Agile manifesto. Uh, shifting what we focus on and, um, and what we value from, a, from below the line to above the line. From contract to customer, moving the focus from agreement or contract signed up front when we know the least to understanding and working directly with the customer. So this brings the customer and the developers into collaboration, drawing the line on separation. Bringing the business or the customer and development together. But what about development and operations? Traditionally, um, development and operations have opposite goals. Development, maximum speed, operations, maximum stability. Not only is ops forgotten, but uh, dev and ops are set up for disaster with their opposite goals. It's a lose-lose situation. So enter our second hero of the story, DevOps. So DevOps brings dev and ops together. So how does this relate to Agile? Extending the value stream from business to development to operations, and connecting all three as a value stream, DevOps extends Agile across that full value stream. So reaching our story's conclusion, let's summarize. At the beginning, I asked you two questions. The first was, what do you know about what inspired the DevOps movement? Hopefully providing additional insights, supplementing what you already knew, we looked at the timeline, showing tiered production system, systems thinking, lean, agile, and infrastructure as code. I then indicated that additional pressures driving the movement the organization's need for agility in a VUCA world, and the complexities and changes through adapting to new technologies and specializations, micro-specialization, complification, and microservices. And of course, as Daniel Pink writes about in his book, uh, Drive, there are new types of workers with the drive for purpose, autonomy, and mastery, the rise of the knowledge worker. And with this, we have the convergence of DevOps, a term coined by John Willis, to describe this movement in the DevOps handbook. Earlier, I referenced a quote from John Willis indicating that DevOps is a movement culminating from a series of significant events. So we get to the other question that I asked, and this was, why do you care about the DevOps movement? Or why should you care about the DevOps movement? Well, for me, it's simultaneously personal as well as something that's big of a part of a public and a big movement. First of all, being part of the revolution, taking back our autonomy, moving away from the organization as a machine and us unfairly called resources 
to the organization as a living system and having ourselves recognized for what we are, valuable, knowledgeable, and driven. Getting our lives back, no more weekend or long weekend implementations, and doing work that actually gets implemented and used, feeling like we have a purpose, and learning and mastering new things. Another reason to care about the DevOps movement is that by understanding why and where it comes from, this opens you up to understand about the culture and the mindset. Uh, many of the reports, like the puppet reports, state that one of the biggest hindrances to DevOps adoption is culture. So why not understand that better and make sure that we can help our organizations adopt DevOps? It's not about the tools and practices. It's about the behavior changes. Thinking differently, that paradigm shift that's needed to move from the dysfunction that DevOps recognized in our industry. And it's about continuous improvement. It's about realizing that the revolution continues, that what started in 2007 and 2008 will be continued and improved on. You don't have to be a Gene Kim, Patrick Dubois, or John Willis to contribute. You can be an ordinary Joe, Jane, or Pam. And that's what I'd like to leave you with. Something you should be, that should be fairly easy for you to remember me by, uh, and why I love DevOps. Daniel Pink, in his book, Drive, talks about the knowledge work being driven by the need for purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And looking back at the origins of DevOps and how it led to DevOps today, I hope that I've managed to inspire you and left you with something to remember. And with that, I'll open up for some questions. Thank you, Pam. Do you have questions? I, I, I have one. Um, so Pam, you're consulting for various companies and you're working with, uh, with the companies to implement uh, and introduce DevOps. Could you tell us about um, where would you start? Let's say someone is working for an organization that does not have DevOps yet. Now uh, they've got some pockets of agility maybe. What would be the next step? What would you do? What do you recommend? Oh gosh, um, I think it depends on where do they want to go? What do they actually want to achieve? And um, I think finding out what are those pockets of agility? Why did they start? And where do those people actually want to move towards? What is their, what is their appetite? And then making sure that you've got those big building blocks in place. Who are the leaders supporting it? Uh, what is the culture like? Why are they adopting DevOps? Is it just the tools and practices? Are they changing, uh, they're changing everything fundamentally? And then, um, and then I would start with, with the pockets and say, all right, um, how do we make sure that what they're doing, they do really well so that more and more people want to join them, so that this revolution starts within that organization, so that um, these pockets don't get blocked by the organization, but they actually drive the change out in the organization. So I think there are two things with that. It's just one is to show the example and demonstrate uh, shining star teams. And then two is to make sure that they're actually supported at different levels of the organization and take that across. No, great. Thank you. So change by example. Change by example and support. Yeah, I think it can't survive without the support. <laughs> And uh, so you touched uh, touched actually on this point. Um, one of the challenges, the culture, how you approach change the, of the culture and what are the other elements um, that most of organizations really face when trying to, to, uh, to, to implement DevOps? Um, I think that some of the big challenges is not having the right, um, the right skill set. So trying to do DevOps, not having enough people who actually know about what is required with the culture change or knowing the, um, the, the practices. So actually making sure that everyone uh, learns quickly and can learn on the job. Um, and I think with the culture, it's just not knowing what DevOps really is and thinking it's only the, it's only the practices. Um, not, not going in there with, without enough information and not having the, the training and the expertise. Okay, thank you. We've got, uh, we've got uh, two questions um, from Sawat. Um, thanks a lot for the great presentation. I wonder, since software process and methodologies keep changing, what do you think as could be the next step after DevOps or the future of DevOps in the next 10 years? 
I guess so. Uh, Crystal ball. <laughs> no ops is coming next to automate everything. <laughs> um, and I think that eventually it would be, just become a way of working, that we would go through this revolution and it would be that we're, we're now no longer having to say, change the culture. It would just be a, a way of working for people. And of course, the technologies are going to continuously change, but just automatically adopting and continuously improving and making and organizations actually functioning that way. That would be my, my guess if I had a crystal ball. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another, another great question from Andrew. Uh, do you find that resistance to change is still a thing versus wanting to change, but not knowing how? That's a good one. I think it's both. You know, uh, I look at uh, some companies and they're, they're stuck in a space of um, unconscious incompetence. So they don't even know where they need to change because they, they think they, they know everything. Uh, so I think that there's, there's both those things that occur is that people don't realize and they're resistant, whether it's subconsciously resistant or re resistant and they're not even realizing it. Uh, and then there are people who also don't know how. So, you know, they're frustrated. They want to change. They see things are working. Um, and usually these are people who, if they go to work in an agile and DevOps environment uh, and they come back to an organization that isn't using that, they'll get really frustrated and just leave. Yeah, I, I, I asked that question because um, uh, where, where I'm involved in is uh, very squarely in the uh, uh, DevSecOps space. Uh, I, I work for Sonatype. Uh, if you don't know who that is, it's uh, uh, Maven Central. Um, and uh, uh, we have an entire team devoted to providing DevOps services to our commercial customers. Um, so when uh, when... Uh, when we get folks like uh, Boeing or you know some of the banks uh, who want to um, uh, want to utilize uh, our product, but they don't know how to necessarily build a uh, uh, a, uh, a release and update pipeline for it, we have we we have sales engineers who go do that for the customers as part of uh, post sales onboarding. Um, but um, uh, I, I was just kind of wanting to know, uh, you know, is a is a is a on a, on a broader scale, um, you know, are, are, are organizations still resisting DevOps methodologies or is it just, you know, they, they just don't know what to do. They don't have the in-house expertise. They don't understand um, uh, agile methodologies. They don't understand infrastructure as code. So it's just kind of curious, kind of curious where that's at for you. Um, Andrew, you know, the public report's really fantastic because it shows where different organizations are at. And I, I would highly recommend having a look at that and seeing, you know, what are the levels of maturity? And it's got a fantastic maturity model as well. And, you know, some organizations are on the far side is that, you know, they're still using the land, they still have um, waterfall practices. They're saying, what is agile? How are agile and DevOps related? They're having these types of questions. And then, of course, you've got the the Amazons and the Facebooks that are doing multiple deployments a day, and they're the ones breaking ground and um, bringing about new technologies and new practices. So, um, I think in, in general, there is still there there is still resistance because these organisations are in different different sides of the scale. So, if you're working for an Amazon, I'm, I'm sure there would not be resistance to DevOps. I'm sure it would be this is just the way we work, and they're at that stage in their evolution. But I think a lot of companies are just starting to leverage DevOps. And like what the Puppet Report says is that what is still the blocks to it? And culture is always coming up as one of those. It's just people fall back on their old ways of working or their old ways of doing things. And it's, it's hard to break out of those silos because that's where we've grown up in our careers and that's how we've done things. So it's, it's really hard to, to break through that. I don't know if that answers your question for you. It does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Alex, your hand is up, waiting very patiently. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Hi, Pam. Um, okay. Thank you very much uh, for this very nice review. If I understood correctly from just reading between the lines in your slides, especially when you, at the beginning when you said the uh, happy path, the ideal, idyllic story where a customer knows exactly what they want and we deliver and everybody's super happy. And uh, I think the, uh, what you try to convey here 
is that things are not as certain as we may assume when we are managing the business. So could you maybe talk a little bit more about how do, how do you see DevOps handle this uncertainty, which we, we, we grew to recognize and to say, look, yeah, we can make a plan, but God knows what's gonna happen next month. Uh, things are uncertain and how does um, you know, DevOps, uh, is there something revolutionary, as you, you did mention of revolution, that changes our way of dealing with uncertainty because it's un uncertainty is unavoidable. Nobody, nobody has a crystal ball, right? Thank you, Pam. So I think from the agile perspectives, what helps with the uncertainty is actually saying, you know, first of all, let's recognize which paradigm, which uh, paradigm we're in, an urban diagram. Is it something that is obvious and we can just apply best practice? We're constructing a building. We don't need to um, have changing requirements. We've done this many times. We can apply a cookie cutter approach and best practice works very well there. But what happens if we are expect, we don't know what we don't know and um, we're in that complex domain. So that's where Agile really helps with that. And applying Agile with DevOps is really, uh, is, is really beneficial because you're bringing, uh, you, you're saying you recognize the complexity and you're preparing yourself to be able to uh, change very quickly in response to complexity. So when things happen that you didn't expect, you can quickly pivot and you can uh, make those changes and you're getting that fast feedback as opposed to waiting for a long, long period and then finding out, oh, but this was the wrong solution uh, and we jumped to a solution too fast. So I think that's where Agile helps with it and uh, why Agile complements DevOps so much is that it actually helps with the complexity and bringing the business and uh, the development together. And then where DevOps helps is um, instead of just flipping something over the fence from development to operations, um, making sure that it's completely supported and that then the, um, the, the things that we don't know in that space are also accommodated because the teams are working together and we've got the technology that supports it that when we want to react quickly to the changes that come about, we can from an agile perspective, but we can also from a technology perspective because we can implement very quickly and then we don't wait for a long period to, um, re to release. We can actually um, pull our requirements, everyone works together very well and you can release it really quickly as opposed to, well, now implementation is gonna take us two weeks. So let's bundle up as much as we can and have a big implementation weekend. So in a nutshell, um, just to summarize, yeah, Agile, um, helping with the front end part of it, making sure that we're able to address the complexity or get the fast feedback when we are expecting unknown unknowns. And then DevOps, making sure that we can implement very quickly and smoothly, and that the, the speed that we gain with Agile is recognized and we can, do, we, can, um, we can benefit from that. And Alex, does that answer your question? Absolutely, thank you very much, Pam. And uh, you're absolutely right. And Andre can confirm here. Uh, I know that Andre is a big fan of quick feedback. We are working to try and get, um, you know, uh, deploy as soon as possible and maybe deploy after, at the end of every work day, just to get feedback and to adjust the course. Because if we are just assuming that things are not gonna change, we are running a straight line, and then by the time we arrive, we, uh-oh, something changed. So thank you very much, Pam. This is excellent. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for the question. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got one more question, but uh, because we are sort of uh, tight on time, I'm going to, Pam, ask you to maybe answer this question uh, in the chat or maybe after the after the, the the final presentation. So we are going to move to the second part of our um, meetup and um, the, our next topic is going to be why we should not or should or should not care about pipelines. And this time we have not one, not two, but three speakers. So Said, Kevin and Willie will provide insights into their journey to consolidate hundreds of inconsistent continuous delivery pipeline snowflakes into state-of-art pipeline as code based on YAML and reusable templates. Over to you guys. Thank you, Andre. I think you just summarized our whole presentation in one. Um, can you just okay, let's go home. You, <laughs> you can all go home. Can you just confirm you can see my, my screen? 
Andre, you can see my screen? Yes, yes. Uh, excellent. Great. So welcome to the world of pipelines. If I get out of the way, you'll see kind of an array of pipelines. Um, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, first of all, share our passion and the learnings we've made. Uh, we pick up from where we left off, I think just over a year ago with the Common Engineering System at WorkSafe BC session. I think it was in April or May. Um, Andre can type in the, the correct URL, but wow, time really flies. Um, a year and let's see what we've actually accomplished. So your friendly hosts for this session are uh, Zaid, who will be representing development. Uh, Kevin, who always keeps us in our solutions secure. Uh, and myself, Willie, uh, representing our common engineering system or ops. Um, and as I put the slide up, I remember what you were saying, Pam, that DevSecOps is kind of a thing of the past. So I think we have to also upgrade our mindset. But here we go. So let us start by looking at why do we need our pipelines and why we need to continuously improve them, which answers the first question on the cover slide is we definitely need pipelines for the automation part. But I'm going to take a step back and one of my favorite definitions of DevOps is by Donovan Brown, who defined it as the union of people, process and products to enable the continuous delivery of value to our customers. So what strikes out to me is the word continuous, which encourages us to automate everything automatable, move repetitive tasks to machines and not take work away, but enable engineering to focus on delighting our customers with features. Nobody wants the pipelines you can see behind me. Um, nobody even knows they exist. So it's zero business value. One thing I just want to emphasize is you don't have to take any notes. Uh, we will be sharing the slides, elaborate them on our technical works at BC blog, and the URL will share as well. And I'm going to track the whys in a simple checklist as we progress through our story in this session. So here's the first point that I've pulled out of Donovan Brown's definition. And I'll take a next step. Um, and with today's disruption so prevalent, which I think Pam, you alluded to, and there being such a critical demand for the speed of change, which is another thing that I love about DevOps enabling us to change things quicker and quicker. Um, the agents of chaos created guardrails defined by five essential values for the DevOps mindset. And again, I'll share the URL at the bottom right hand. The one value encourages us to innovate and improve beyond repeatable processes by reducing waste, which has been our past focus or past year's focus, and not doing things with no value or purpose. So for example, um, I have a strong opinion that um, software developers should not be focusing on pipelines. They should be focusing on business value. Again, customers don't like pipelines. They like business value features. So that adds one additional why to our checklist, innovate and improve beyond repeatable processes. So again, I guess everybody gathered, we're not talking about pipelines to carry oil, but an enabler to automate continuous integration and delivery tasks. So we as an organization embraced uh, the Azure DevOps pipelines and standardized on the unified pipeline, which is one of our guardrails, which helped us build once, deploy the same artifact to different environments and continuously streamline our manual approvals. We shifted left. We were in process and product heaven. Until our automated weekly pipeline reports unearthed a scary and unsettling reality. Unfortunately, Kevin, I don't see you on video, but that's usually where you cringe. We have over 3000 pipeline definitions and they are growing at an alarming rate and creating what I refer to as a pile of shocking technical debt. 
Um, one of the reasons is on autonomy that we've given to all engineers inspired what we refer to as a variety of snowflakes, some of which introduce alarming vulnerabilities and a growing number of release rejections by security. Also, about two years ago, Microsoft began very subtly referring to the user interface-based Azure pipelines as classic, which for me was a red flag. And there were clear signs on their product um, roadmap that technology was becoming stale. So in essence, rot was setting in and we therefore started to experiment with YAML-based Azure pipelines in two consecutive hackathons, or what we refer to as the interface today. Um, the bad news is we did not catch the attention of business, which I emphasized in the beginning because nobody is interested in pipelines. So we won no prize at the hackathons, but we embarked on a exciting journey after adding alignment, consistency, simplicity, security, flexibility, and transparency to our pipeline checklist. So these are all goals that we wanted to achieve. And if you remember from the talk a year ago, we were also talking about we need telemetry. Um, so that is one of the things we actually bolted onto our pipelines without the engineers having to do anything. Our pipelines are fully um, telemetrized, if I can invent that term. Um, and we are pouring horrendous amounts of data into application insights, which at some point somebody has to start analyzing. So what did we do that is so exciting? Of, we embrace the YAML-based Azure pipelines, as I mentioned, um, and they are based on the mature and human-readable data serialization originally proposed by Clark Evans in 2001. Um, you might have heard it being referred to as yet another markup language or YAML ain't markup language. Um, the good news coming from the Microsoft Azure DevOps camp is that the YAML pipelines are structurally YAML. In other words, Microsoft introduced no deviation or snowflakes on their own, which they have done in the past. And they even forked the Azure DevOps pipeline repository to build the GitHub pipelines. So for us, that means it's like applying a protective anti-rust coating on our Azure DevOps pipelines uh, because it's opening exciting coexistence and migration opportunities to future products like GitHub. We also embrace pipeline as code with our YAML templates. Um, Jenkins, I think, was the organization that introduced the term and the technique that treats the pipeline configuration as code, placed under version control, uh, packaged in reusable components, and automated deployment and testing. I always compare it with infrastructure as code, but the most important thing to highlight, it's the golden fleece for our pipeline adventure. Because pipeline as code enabled us to place all pipeline artifacts in source control repos, which can be viewed by all our engineers. There are no secrets. So welcome transparency considered one of the core ingredients to agile and lean development, as well as in my personal opinion, a healthy DevOps mindset because it fosters trust. We also enable our engineers to contribute to our common engineering system by submitting pipeline changes um, and innovations through the pull request workflow, i.e. we are centralizing, not standardizing our pipelines. Um, and lastly, we enable our engineers by injecting reusable templates when they queue the Azure pipelines, sprinkling the concept of shift left in brackets, Kevin is starting to smile, automatically and consistently. And consistently is one of the words that I think I have to go back to Pam's um, survey and just type that in on about five screens because 
you know, and automation and the DevOps mindset is actually allowing us to come up with a consistent uh, common engineering system, which if I put my ops hat on is bliss. We can finally support all the stuff that we've been building. So in, as mentioned, um, kind of the waste was always back of our minds, especially at the hackathons and proof of concepts where we highlighted not only the risk of rotten technologies, but what I refer to as engineering distractions and the focus on waste instead of value. Uh, for example, a typical YAML-based CI pipeline in our environment for an Azure function requires about 300 lines of code. With 920 CI pipelines, and please don't ask me why I picked 927 and not another number, it must be my Swiss DNA going back to the reports. Uh, this amounted when I did the calculations to nearly 300,000 lines of code that engineers had to craft. That's more lines of code than Photoshop 1.0 and just less than Quake 3 engine. And if you look at the graph, the space shuttle code is actually not far behind. So again, I'm going to emphasize this. In my humble opinion, this is a huge pile of waste, which we could have invested in a much better way. So our first generation generic blueprint based pipelines halved and reduced this to 113,000 lines of code for continuous integration and 25,900 lines of code when we move to our app type blueprint based pipelines. So you can actually see our focus has been to reduce the waste and increase the consistency or in brackets, quality and security all for Kevin. So I recommend that you read parts three, four, and five of our pipeline series on our Technical Works at BC blog for more information on the templates. Um, those blogs cover how templates allowed us to define reusable CI and CD tasks, um, keeping our main pipeline definition razor focused. And I think, Saeed, you will actually demonstrate that what the engineers see and have to worry about or are accountable for is very minimal lines of code. Uh, the templates also enable us to script and assemble pipelines at queue time, which I always refer to as this is the glue and the magic. Because unlike the old user interface, user interface defined pipelines, we actually build the definition of the, pipe, uh, the pipeline at runtime based on the templates and the context within which the pipeline runs. So instead of editing hundreds of classic pipelines in a GUI editor, which I agree all of you or all of you would agree with me can be mind numbing and really error prone if you actually ask Willie to edit 200 pipelines by hand. I'm probably gonna do the first 13, which is my lucky number, um, exceptionally well. Thereafter, you'll actually see a decline of quality and an increase of calls from Kevin, i.e. from security. So with our blueprint-based pipelines, we actually edit one template to make a change, such as changing our guardrails. Which one's saved is automatically injected into all pipelines that are queued thereafter. It is true magic. And a, a real world example, um, DevSecOps has asked us to remove Sonar queue from our pipelines. Um, with our unified pipelines, that unfortunately means we are gonna give the likes of Zaid and Andre um, a long list of pipelines. And we're gonna say, start at the top and Zaid, you start at the bottom and we shall meet somewhere in between because we have to manually edit all these pipelines and remove that task called SonarCube. It's actually got three, so it's actually gonna be even more mind numbing. Or with the new pipelines, we go into the repo, change one template, submit a pull request, get the core team to approve, and any pipeline queued thereafter has no more Sonar queue. Again, magic.
So as a software developer, do I really want to own, for example, create and maintain the pipelines to build and deploy my application? My answer is no. Um, I will gladly hand that to another team, um, give them the responsibility, while I focus on creating value for the business, delivering quality software. I just want to be able to access the build templates and an, abil an ability to suggest changes so that I can learn, innovate, and troubleshoot issues, if any. And that kind of ties back to some of the things you were saying, Pam, is um, the abbreviation of Pam to have a purpose um, and mastery, which is where I need to see things and I need to learn and I need to be able to innovate. And then with the first gen app type blueprints, we introduce reusable application type continuous integration blueprints, which typically require me to update a bit of configuration and I'm done. And I think Zay, that's what you're gonna be demonstrating is I really have to just tweak only two or three lines of config code and I'm done. I can actually start focusing on writing my app. If you look at the blog posts, um, you'll also see some fairy dust, as I call it, which is the extend template feature, uh, which at runtime or queue time allows us to verify that a pipeline is based on known and trusted templates. If not, it's automatically rejected by the service connection and or environment checkpoints at runtime with zero humanoid intervention. But there is more. If you read part eight of the pipeline series, um, you'll be amazed with our second generation app type blueprints, which are an early preview in two of our engineering environments. Um, it's the same as the first generation, but it now covers both continuous integration or CI and continuous deployment CD. And again, we are not standardizing or hiding the implementation. Engineers can review all templates, submit improvements via pull requests, as previously mentioned. So if the proposed change is within our guardrails, in brackets, um, standards, policies, um, governance, um, we will innovate the common engineering system. If not, we collaborate with engineering and security to hopefully reach a consensus or terminate the pull request with Kevin said so. More about that in a minute. So let's take a deep breath um, and a quick pause uh, to look at our checklist. Um, and you'll realize that we have actually ticked off all items over the past year, except for automate everything automatable. So we have not yet realized our dream for self-service automation, although we are so, so close. And I was so, so tempted to show you a demo today of what we've actually achieved there, but we decided we will move that to another uh, session because I'm, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of discussions and, and questions. Um, so at this point, we are at a good place where our blueprint-based pipelines are automation enablers. Uh, they are consistent and simple. So the pipeline working group is actively collaborating with our automation working group to build a hello world in less than a minute, also referred to as our walking skeleton engineering process. In other words, as an engineer, I want to press one button, maybe answer a few or as, as few questions as possible. And I want the common engineering system to build me a repository with a sample code in it, uh, with the pipeline in the repository. Um, I wanted to tie it up with the pipeline in Azure DevOps and actually queue the pipeline so that I can double check that the sample that I've actually just inherited builds and deploys in order. Now, that's what we are referring to as a walking skeleton. So I did a quick poll on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I must be honest, I was flabbergasted with the high percentage of users who tolerate hours to days 
to get a basic project environment assembled, i.e. the repository and the pipeline. I find this completely unacceptable. Um, and Alex has seen the demo. Um, we can actually push it right to the left. So shift left, also on this diagram, we will push it on to the left. I, we, we are talking about seconds, no longer hours or days. So while you travel back home after today's meetup, or maybe virtual travel home, because most of us are probably at home, um, ponder whether you would prefer working in this humanoid-driven world where somebody will create your repository, will create your CI pipeline, will create your CD pipeline, will then double check that all the pipelines and repos are adhering to guardrails, all of which needs humanoid um, intervention, um, and after hours or days, you can start developing the features. I don't know if you would be happy in that world. I definitely no longer am. I prefer to live in the humanoid enabled world um, where we will actually see that the automation generates all the fluff for me, um, the noise, the pipelines, the repos, um, and actually also validates against our guardrails because a machine is exceptional in doing the same thing a million times the same way, unlike us. So kind of the compliance and adherence to guardrails becomes a lot easier. Um, and I hope, Andre, that we will get another opportunity to return to this meetup with our automation success story soon, because it is what I refer to as gobsmacking. It is, it's, it's an eye opener of what can actually be done. So keep an eye on our technical WorkSafe BC blog, where we are sharing in-depth information on all our pipelines. We share everything. Transparency is number one. Um, and other innovations such as the quick ref posters, such as the generic blueprints, um, and the blueprint based quick reference posters. But now I'm going to take two steps back because I need to take a, a, a sip of water and switch back to Pam's survey. Pam, do you have any results for us yet at this point? Fantastic, thank you. And I'd love to give you a chance to have some water and let me share a screen and I can show you some results. Um, we just get onto the white screens here. Um, thank you everyone for participating. It's really uh, great to see how many people participated. It's a fantastic interactive group. And we go. So share, here we go. Uh, great, so what did you say? What inspires you about working in DevOps? Uh, wow, automation, getting a lot of attention, collaboration, innovation, value, release on demand, um, a little bit about speed, pipelines, agility, um, stimulation, no blame, um, sharing end-to-end. -end. Um, yeah, I'll let you read the rest, but quite, quite interesting. Um, really nice to see collaboration and automation transparency coming up. I think it just shows the relationship between Agile and DevOps is that they're intricately involved. And then the next one is, where are you on your journey? Um, no one's just interested. That's great. We actually have some people who are on this side of the scale, on the right-hand side of the scale. No lone rangers. 22% um, of respondents said one team and a few capabilities. 44% said a few teams and capabilities. And 33% at fully fledged and continuously improving. That's fantastic. Wow, that's really um, good to see that organizations are thriving and continuously improving. Um, well, I hope I've given you enough chance to, to drink some water. <laughs> yes, thank you. Fantastic result. I mean, just looking at it fully fledged and continuously improving, that's that's a great job. I was not expecting that uh, 33%. That's great. Mm. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you for participating. And I, I did respond to the questions in the in the group. If you have more questions, you're welcome to send them on through and I'll, I'll respond in the group as well and not take more of your time, Willie. So. Uh, I will give back your screen. So let me stop the screen share. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you giving me that chance.
All right, and back to pipelines, context switch. Uh, so I just want to kind of summarize by saying that how we managed and at times battled to grok the intricacies of YAML. Um, if you've worked with YAML, you will know it is not forgiving with spaces. Um, and how we evolved the emerging application type blueprint based pipelines is kind of beyond the scope of today's chat. I could talk on for another at least 12 hours. Um, but Andre, I'm sure we can come back and share the automation part, which is really exciting. Um, and in the meantime, I really encourage you to um, visit our technical uh, WorksFBC blog um, and feel free to connect to us via Twitter or LinkedIn to discuss your questions after today's meetup and also start scratching on how did we actually do it? So what's next? I would like to now invite my colleague Said to jump in. So developer hat on um, and give us a quick demo and a glimpse of the pipeline as code magic. If you can't, I'm gonna stop sharing and pipelines are all yours. Thank you, Willie. So, um, can you see my screen? Perfect. Okay, great. So, um, uh, I'm going to talk about the second generation uh, application um, uptype blueprints and um, where this idea of uh, uptype blueprints came from. It's uh, an existing uh, concept in Azure DevOps. So if you go to Azure DevOps and try to create a new pipeline, um, after you uh, choose the repo, Azure DevOps will uh, provide you with a list of uh, suggested uh, templates that you can use. So if I am building an ASP.NET application, there is this YAML file that will be created for me. And we have the steps that are needed to build uh, an ASP.NET app, which is um, I need to restore my Nugget packages, build the code, run the tests. So with uh, uptype blueprints, we're trying to do something similar but specific to works ABC where we uh, inject our um, security uh, scans and where we um, enforce our guard, guard rights. So um, let's go and check what we did for the Azure functions. So for the Azure functions here, we have this CI template uh, uh, where we have a bunch of parameters, but after that we have the steps where we um, uh, use where we use here, we use Git tools to uh, set this uh, semantic version for our uh, code. Then we uh, restore our Nugget packages from the our um, our uh, Nugget feed. Here we inject the security scan uh, scripts where we initialize some uh, some uh, scans. Then we build run tests and publish our artifacts. After that, we publish the results from the uh, security scans and we collect some uh, telemetry. After the uh, build part or CI part, there's a deployment part. And here we are making it flexible where we can uh, inject a custom template to uh, deploy our um, uh, as a function or we can just use the uh, standard one. So if we go to the CD part, um, it's a, a, um, a list of uh, stages. So uh, where we deploy our as a function to a system um, a test environment. After that, we have a security uh, scan step, security review stage, then staging and production. And if you notice here, um, maybe I can zoom a little bit. If you notice here, staging and uh, production environment are uh, 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 injected only if we are coming from a release branch. And if you, one more thing that I want to mention here, these variables in our CD template are coming from 
configuration file. So for each application, there is a configuration file where we set all these values and it's automatically injected into the pipeline. So this is how the Azure function uh, template, CI CD template, it looks like under the hood. But as a developer, I don't care about that. I only care about this file, which we call starter. So this file where we have kind of, if we remove the, co uh, the comments, only kind of 30 lines of code, this is what the developer need to copy paste to the repo. So if I'm working on another function, I need to copy paste this file and I need to set the values for the portfolio name and product name. Maybe I'm using a different co .NET core version, so I need to update this one. And that's it, I can run my um, build pipeline. Um, one thing to mention here, we have some uh, flags where we suppress CD equal true means that we don't want to run the CD part, we only want to run the CI part. This is useful if we just started working on the, the application and we don't want to deploy it right away. Maybe our Azure resources are not created yet. So we just want to make sure that we can build our code. So if we run this, how it looks like, uh, so it will automatically inject all the steps uh, that are um, referenced in the template. So we have the Git version steps. We have the security scan steps here with collecting some telemetry. After that, we have our steps where we want to build, run tests, and publish uh, the artifacts. Then again, we have some uh, security uh, uh, steps here where we publish the, the results of the, the scans and we collect again some uh, telemetry. And as um, Willie mentioned, it, when we are going to remove Cernet Cube, we just need to go to the template and remove these steps and they will uh, kind of magically disappear when we run the pipeline again. Uh, so this is how the uh, uh, build looks like, but what about the whole CI CD pipeline? So it will look something like this where we are, we have the CI part, then we deploy to a development environment, a system test environment, then we have the security scans step. Um, if you notice here, we don't have the staging and production environments because this change is coming from a master branch. If we were coming from a release branch, our pipeline will look like this, where we have the security review steps added, staging and production. So there is no way we can, um, by mistake, deploy code from master into uh, production. One uh, more thing I want to mention here is when we create these environments um, that we can see here in the, um, let me go back here, uh, no, not this one. In the CD part, we have we have stages uh, where we deploy like system uh, staging and production. So these stages, we can uh, put up uh, what we call approval and checks, where we, one of the checks is to uh, require a template. So we say that anything deployed to this environment uh, will need to be extended from this specific Azure function uh, template. And um, if you go and edit the environment, there is a list of checks that we can add. So we can add approvals. Uh, so uh, a, a person or a group of uh, users need to approve before we go to, uh, to a defined stage. Or, and we can, here we can uh, uh, require a specific uh, template so uh, that we allow only code, uh, we allow only pipelines that extend that template to deploy to uh, that specific environment. Uh, I think uh, that's it for my uh, CI CD uh, part. Uh, back to you, uh, Willie. Thank you very much, Saeed. And I, I like the part where you said, I don't care about all of the stuff you just covered, I only care about this file. 
Um, our challenge is obviously to convince the, the rest of the engineering community, um, but let's see how we get there. Uh, now, before we jump into the Q&A, I think it's time to invite our security lifeline, as I call it. So, Kevin, can you give us an insight into your world and explain why pipelines are so important to security? Also, if you could enlighten us why you've been smiling from ear to ear ever since the blueprints emerged from the pipeline working group. So over to you, Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Willie. Thank you, Saeed. Let me share my screen quickly. All right. So <laughs> I, I've been smelling a lot of everything being talked about so far by Willie because a lot of this stuff um, um, that we're doing with these pipelines addresses like so many deep seated issues when it comes to security of these systems. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for having me here tonight to let me speak to you all. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I haven't given a talk to a community group in I think four or five years now. So this is the first time I've done one on Zoom. It's, uh, it's not the same as being in person when I can see everyone laugh at my jokes in person. So it's quite a bit different. Um, so yes, uh, I am a DevSecOps person. So this has been a very interesting discussion to listen to so far. And I'm hopefully going to be able to shed some light as well on why DevSecOps is important, but not in the way that people think it is necessarily. So I'm Kevin. I have a complicated Dutch last name you don't have to worry about. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm honored to be speaking to you all from the unceded land of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. I'm starting to include these in all my presentations, which I didn't used to, due to increased awareness and inclusiveness and all these things. So I've worked in IT for almost a decade, actually. I was trying to do the math the other day, and it's actually about a decade. Um, about seven years of that is in security, and I've worked at WorkSafe BC with Saeed and Willie and Andre and Pam at one point for a little over three years. Um, I've done a whole bunch of different parts of IT. Um, ironically enough, I never started on help desk like a lot of people do. I did a lot of systems administration, architecture, engineering, be in space and brackets there. As one other participant of this call will know, I used to work for a space and aerospace company. Um, did lots of cool stuff there. When I went into security, started with network security, server security, red team, blue team, purple team, every color team under the sun. And when I went to WorkSafe, I changed my security focus into web applications and cloud security. And all of those interests led me to Azure DevOps and pipelines. One of the things that I've discovered is um, more important in my career is focusing on things that actually I am very passionate about in security when it comes to standardization, consistency, collaboration, communication, inclusiveness, and respect. And all that goes into what is the human factor of security, which um, a lot of security has not focused on for a long time. You know, a lot of people have said security is the department of no. We say no, we, we, we hit reject, we stop you from doing things, all sorts of things. But it's um, one thing that I'm wanting to work toward is changing that perception and how security interacts with engineers and the business. You can find me on Twitter. You should not find me on LinkedIn because I don't check it because I get hundreds of spam messages every week on that. And I gave up on that website a long time ago. So as a lot of you already heard from Said and Willie, we have a problem. We have thousands of pipeline definitions and how can you have any standardization or consistency if you have thousands of, of, thousands of unique pipeline definitions? This means there's vulnerabilities everywhere and they're gonna be present in places that we don't even know and we can't possibly know. They're everywhere. Um, and we are, as I've learned, we're discovering new ones every day. I think our total number of vulnerable libraries alone, I think it's down to about 2,500 right now. So they're everywhere. It's a constant never ending struggle. Sketchy approval situation. This is my favorite one. This is why I was smiling half the time when Saeed and Willie were, were, were showing their presentations, but one of the most important fundamental questions you can ask in security is you have to be able to know who did what when. And when you don't have any kind of consistency or standardization or oversight into, into who is approving what releases when, you can't answer that question necessarily. Um, one other thing is that we end up being stuck on old technology. 
we're working on implementations on a pipeline we made four years ago that hasn't been touched ever since. And it's still trying to run things in that pipeline that the technologies don't even exist in our centralized implementation anymore. As a result of all of this, you don't know what risk your organization is facing. You can't possibly know. Um, and that's scary. You need to be able to know and truly understand and track and record what risk you're facing. And that risk could come in many different forms when it comes to your software and your software practices, your CI CD practices, all these things. So DevSecOps, this is um, something that, I mean, it, it's a relatively new concept for me in the past few years, and I've learned a lot about this. And one thing I find interesting about this, so a lot of you see, have seen this diagram before, this is the infinity symbol of DevOps. So this is present in so many things, different things, but what DevSecOps is, it's the application of security to DevOps. It's not so much a practice, it's not so much necessarily a team or a person or a job or a career or anything like that. It's simply the, it, it, I view it personally as, as kind of a more broad high level concept where you apply security to every part of a DevOps process, every single part. So I'll kind of tell you what I mean by this. So shifting left is such a, isn't that a cool arrow, by the way? This, this is why I wanted to present. Um, <laughs> so shifting left is the most important thing in the world of DevSecOps and what this means. So we're talking about, we're adding security into the practice of every developer, every part of the business, from the inception of an application all the way through to the release. But we want to do everything as early as possible. And by doing this, we emphasize that, and Pam, um, you mentioned this in your presentation, but the days where security is one specific team, which, which we kind of are on, on outside looking in, those are over. We have to look at security being something that everyone has an awareness of, and everyone is able to apply security principles and ideas to their role. They could be a developer, they could be a business engineer, they could be um, an accountant, an analyst, they could be a director. Um, we want everyone to have some awareness of security because that's the only way, as I mentioned before, that we can understand the risks the organization faces. One of the biggest things that we're doing in DevSecOps is that we're sharing, we're teaching, we're training, we're educating, we're trying to pass on information, we're trying to create an open practice. Like again, gone are the days where security is a closed door department to say no. We're trying to empower everyone in an organization to think about security. And this is, this is my favorite line, but we trust people, but we verify. Um, this is a huge change. And I know that this is going to put a smile on Willie's face because we've talked about this many times. But the security approach historically is that you don't trust and you verify. So you put down, you lock, you restrict, you do all these different things. Um, one of the best examples of this, what myself and Willie have talked about is this future concept of passport control, what we think. So when you cross the border, say you have a Nexus card, you're going from Canada to the US, um, you're, they trust you, but they verify. You still talk to the border guard, they still ask you, are you bringing anything back? So they trust you enough to give you a Nexus card, do your background check, let you go back and forth for you without waiting in line, but they verify you're following the rules. If you break that trust, you have to go wait in line with the rest of the peons. You don't get your Nexus card anymore. So you do this, by a, but you empower the individual to gain certain access, rights, practice, processes, um, anything it is. You trust them to handle these things in a responsible way, but you verify that they're doing it. Automation is such a key part of DevSecOps. Now, this is, goes in hand with all of DevOps, but automation is such an important thing. Um, we want to run tasks on machines where possible, not people. And that's totally at odds with what I like to look at as a, the people part, the human factor of security. But the fact of the matter is people make mistakes, people make errors, and people move slowly on any kind of repeatable task. So where possible, we want to run things in an automated way. Continuous detection and response goes into this. So one of the biggest things security is known for before is audit scans. We look at a list from an audit. We do a security scan. We meet all these requirements. We give you a check mark, and you're off to the races. Whoops. Um, the continuous part of this is that we don't just do these scans anymore. We don't do 
a one-off report of vulnerabilities. We're continuously checking every time that pipeline runs, every time the build runs, every time the release runs, you run these scans and checks and you do this because the security process is continuous and ongoing. Threat modeling is a really key part of this. And I actually could do a whole presentation on threat modeling, but I won't, um, that will take forever. Uh, a threat modeling is simply a collaborative process that is not a technical process. Uh, where you talk about the design of an application with everyone from architects, to developers, to business engineers, to product owners, and you learn about the threats and risk of an application. Looks something like this, which looks technical. It's honestly not. I would like to talk about threat modeling more separately. Again, I've done entire presentations on this. We'll talk about that more. Do you want questions about threat modeling? Ask me about this. The last point, most important part of DevSecOps, the application of security DevOps is that we have to start looking at quality means secure. The definition of quality has to mean secure. Um, this is a never ending journey, but this is, I would argue, the most important part of DevSecOps. So why are pipelines this amazing solution I'm talking about here? Reusable standardized templates are more secure because we can go from 3000 snowflakes Again, I really like these 3D images I'm using here. You can go from these 3,000 snowflakes all the way down to as few as possible. And the fewer things you have to secure, the more likely you are to be able to secure them. It's simple math. Um, and because we're talking as few things as possible, a few ways of doing things, we can now implement guardrails. We can implement guidelines. Like if you're walking along a path there and there's a safety railing, we're, we're able to apply standards to the practices that are so to we're ensuring those uh practices are being done in a secure and safe way and we can do this in a way that's automated we can do this in a way that's not in that's not intrusive we can do this in a way that we empower and trust the engineers and the devs and the users to do all these things without security being this big angry beast that steps in and says no at the last minute or ruins all your plans which absolutely was a thing and we can keep these in a centralized and verified uh, place in a single repository. We can see um, uh, the, we can gain a lot of benefit from the um, ability to have these things stored in a transparent and central way. We can do, um, we can see all changes being done to this. We can implement these things where everyone is aware of what's going on and we can repeat them. Uh, we can repeat these as many times as we want. And we can do this again, following standards to as many different practices and applications we want. And to make people like me happy, the security people, we can always put, uh, if we need to require certain approvals, certain mandatory steps. For example, as I mentioned before, we run scans for every release on um, third party packages that might contain vulnerabilities. We can be sure that these will run every time because we only have to implement it in one or very few places as opposed to me spending the next month of my life going through 3000 pipeline definitions, which trust me, that's not happening, I'm too busy. So automating everything you can is such a key part of this. And this is a statement I, I, I've, I've said before elsewhere, but taking the human out of the equation is actually the human friendly and human centric thing to do. A lot of people think that automation is at odds with centering the human in our, in our um, software development practices. But by freeing the human from doing these repetitive or monotonous tasks that a, that a pipeline, that a machine can do, the human is free to do what they do best, which is to do engineering, which is to do um, big thoughts or architectures or designs or finding creative solutions. Like those are the things machines can't do yet. We'll see about that. Um, but by automating what you can, you free up the human to do the things that humans do best. And what humans do best is not creating 3000 plus pipeline definitions and doing all these and doing them over and over again. So because we're doing all these things and it, going back to my earlier point, we now can objectively understand the risk our organization is facing. We couldn't do that before because we didn't know what was going on. There's too much obfuscated. There's too much hidden. There's too much, there's too many snowflakes. By doing this, we now are able to be aware of this. We can guarantee that scans and tests will run. We guarantee this passes all of our requirements. Um, this Im image doesn't mean much. I just thought this was the coolest image to with an audit anyone's ever seen. 
So <laughs> the, the future of this is, um, goes along with what was um, already talked about by Willie and Saeed. Self-service is such a huge thing here. Um, again, because it's playing into the fact that automation is what we have to do. There's no point having human beings doing the same tasks over and over again because a machine can do that. This gives power to the engineers. I had to put within limits in the background because there's always a limit to power you should give people. And I know that Willie's probably laughing at this one just because he and I have talked about this so much. With great power comes great responsibility, right, Willie? So by being able to standardize and get rid of all these snowflakes, we're able to improve the steps that we run, the scans that we run, and the security checks that we have to do for every single release. Um, and as a result, the tools can speak for themselves. This, this, is, this is a key part. Um, not hiding information goes against what security has done for a long time. We want to give users information, we want to trust and empower the users to have this information available right in the pipelines. Um, and again, with great power comes great responsibility. With the power of having the information comes the responsibility to actually fix the problems. Um, and that's where I come in. There has to be understanding after everything I said about automation and everything how big automation is in um, DevSecOps and DevOps as a whole, you can't automate everything. You just can't. You will always have to have the human in there, the human factor, the engineer, the people who interpret things and the people who do the, who do the educate and training. And we never want to stop shifting left. We cannot shift left enough. We want to implement these standards very, very first before anything else happens on a project. When the idea of an application is in someone's head, it's a small little thing. We want to be involved as early as possible because that's the only way you can truly secure from end to end, from start to finish and beyond, is to actually work with the devs, the teams, the organization, the business, anyone that comes up with these ideas involve security at the very start. And that's all I have for you right now. Um, again, any questions at all, I will check the chat shortly if there is anything. Um, I know that we are now moving on to a Q&A component. Um, and again, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. That's by far where I'm the most active. I do not just tweet about InfoSec stuff. It's all over the map. Sometimes it's kind of weird and weird and deranged, but at the same time, I love talking about security. I love trying to change security to the modern DevOps world from what it's always been. And hopefully I will be able to talk more about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. I think we've got already first question, uh, Safwat. Uh, yes, thanks a lot uh, for all of you for the very interesting presentation. Uh, it's a pretty new concept for me. So I was wondering, there is a challenge between having small number of templates that has maybe unnecessary steps or tasks for everyone, but you can secure them and manage them versus having so many number of templates that more customized for every business. So how you manage this trade-off? And another question based on this, how many templates that you have out of the 3000 configuration files, pipelines, how many templates that you ended up with and the two dimensions, maintainability, how may the rate of changing of these templates, because also if I have 3000 files, but I don't change them too much, but I have a few templates, but I change them too much. So it's two dimensions, how you design the template in a relatively optimum way and the, the consequence of this design in a maintainability dimension. So. Sorry, I'm just uh, I'm just uh, absorbing the question. Feel <laughs> free to hop in here, Willie. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll hop in quickly. Um, but I, I think Zaid, you, you need to hop in as well. Uh, it it's I think it's a very loaded question, big question, and I'm actually still processing half of it. But in terms of the three thousand templates, let me try and answer a few things. Out of the three thousand templates we are hoping to actually get those down to a couple of, of dozen, um, no more. Uh, yes, we are creating kind of standard templates for all to use, but the all to use are components that are really driven by, by DevSecOps, i.e. you, Kevin, i.e. The, the scans, 
Um, it's actually mostly the scans and we have the building code that Alex, who is also in the meetup today is actually starting to inject. Um, those are things that all of us have to run anyway as part of the pipelines. So what we have at WorksFBC, which I think has worked very well for us is we have working groups. Um, and for example, the one I'm most passionate about, well, there's actually two now, the automation one has just really caught my, my interest. But the pipeline working group has been so successful in my opinion, because we actually broke down all the silos um, a nice thing, a side effect of DevOps is no more silos. Um, and we actually have representatives of all the disciplines, i.e. the developers, operations, security. All of us are working together. All of us are nitpicking and cherry picking these templates together um, before we actually push them out to, to the organization. So we get input as to what is really important. And we also get input as to what is really waste for me as an engineer. Um, I'm just thinking um, white source, Kevin, at some point, the engineers were pushing back very hard because suddenly the builds were running for 15 minutes. Absolutely, that's a waste for me. I don't want to use white source ever, but I can't remove it because it's part of the blueprint. So that's where the working group actually jumped in and we said, well, let's actually find out what the root cause is. It's definitely not white source. Um, it's not the blueprints. Um, and Kevin, you came up with the magic potion, a revised configuration, which again, we just tweaked, uh, submitted the pull request and suddenly all engineers were happy again. So I think it's gonna be a balance that we have to go through over the next year or so to really get rid of the waste and dwindle down the 3000 pipeline definitions into, I would say a few dozen at the most. Um, if you've listened to what Zaid was, was telling us, there's actually four templates per application type. So for example, all our .NET Core web apps will be based on the same four templates um, going forward, instead of everyone being slightly different because I'm an engineer at heart, I can do things better. And I want to try this tool and this package and I, I'm probably, Kevin is, is smiling again, because this is where all the vulnerabilities come from is if I can actually just put stuff into my pipeline, um, Kevin doesn't know I've just actually inherited a whole library of, 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 of vulnerabilities and nobody realizes until we've pushed it to production, then it's too late. Oh, we can't actually pull this out again because well, the users are delighted. They don't care mm -hmm. about bugs and vulnerabilities. Um, so oh, I'm not sure, yeah, if, I, sure if I'm getting close to the answer, but 3000 down to a dozen um, standardization of the build pipelines and the, the deployment pipelines. Yes, we are working together in working groups to make sure that they are, that everybody has an input. So over to you, Kevin and Zaid. Yeah, the, so actually it's, uh, it's, it's awesome that you mentioned all the packages thing and I, I really appreciate uh, what Andrew said in the chat there. It's one of my favorite topics too. In fact, my two favorite package anecdotes. So the first thing, so if you spin up a new Hello World app, I think at the time I tested it was like Angular version eight, just as a very basic app. I think you start with like 19,000 NPM packages, something like that. And that goes into fact. So one example we had, we had a, uh, Get what I think it might have been. I think it was an npm package, a node package. Um, all of a sudden, one day, the owner of the GitHub repository for that package had actually had their account compromised because they didn't use two factor, and someone put a Bitcoin miner into this package. Um, it had something like 850,000 users. Um, <laughs> would, would, it, would it happen to be one of the ones that uh, uh, we discovered and reported? <laughs> Uh, yes, load I, YAML or load ashes. Yeah. Yes, so I actually think it might have been load ash. I'm trying to remember now. Uh, well, it'd be load load ashes. So that that's that's. There's been a a, a, a big huge problem. I, I linked a blog article. Uh, he's our chief security oh, awesome. researcher. Um, oh, but, this is uh, awesome! Yes. Yeah. So yep. so Ax Sharma, who you would know, uh, yep. is actually our chief security researcher, and. Um, you, you can follow it through to Sonatype's blog if you want, but I've, I've just tried to leave the company branding off of it. Um, but uh, there is a huge, or has been a huge problem with namespace collision 
in um, uh, many of the uh, many of the uh, component repository systems. So uh, NPM, PyPy, um, uh, Central Central wasn't quite as bad, although we uh, uh, we did find issues in there, and we've taken uh, uh, we've taken measures to um, alleviate that because uh, uh, the the backing repository manager for Central supports namespaces, so now we've just started enforcing that. Um, but uh, uh, we made we made basically made everyone that had packages uh, published to Central to uh, uh, go and uh, actually confirm their namespace. Um, but um, but yeah, it's it's just the namespace collision and um, also. Uh, uh, also, um, uh, attackers managing to gain control of and publish uh, um, uh, uh, malicious code into well-known and well-used packages uh, is actually another big thing. Yeah, actually, it, 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 interesting enough, the solar winds attack and the, the big one that happened last year. I, I'm losing all track of time. Was that two years ago now? I last year. Yeah. Uh, so. Sure. So that was an attack on the supply chain, and that is a huge area of risk and vulnerability for, I'm going to say, every organization out there. If you say your organization is not vulnerable to supply chain attacks, I want to talk to you. So, but that's a huge one, um, is any point in that supply chain, whether it's software, hardware, whatever it is, in this case, we're talking about software or injectable packages or dependencies, um, you are completely dependent on the security of every single package that you use as a result. Um, I wanted to mention, Andrew, very fast, you had asked in the chat here about what test, tests and checks would you consider a bare minimum? That's an awesome question because we have to deal with this every day. So in, uh, and to answer you as fast as I can without um, getting too off track here, there's three main categories of security testing. There's DAST, SAST, and SCA. SAST is static application security testing, which looks at source code. DAST is dynamic application security testing, which looks at the applications running. SCA is software composition analysis, which looks at what your software is made of packages. So I would say the bare minimum is one scan from each of those categories. There's so many bells and whistles you can throw in there. So many different types of testing, different types of testing within those general categories. But overall, you want a DAST, you want to like automated pen test, scan your application in a pipeline. SAST, you want to analyze your source code in some way. Um, SonarCube is a great example of that. And actually, it was funny. It was mentioned by William Stuff. We're actually we're talking about taking SonarCube out. The reason for that is not necessarily about the tool. It's about the licensing, which is a whole different topic. Um, and then SCA, Software Composition Analysis, is looking at packages. Because the, a modern application uses code from many, many, many other sources and people and developers and companies and countries and packages and repositories. So we have to know what you're running. Um, anyways, I hope that kind of helps answer your question. I'm happy to talk to you more without any time. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, let's take one more question. Yes. I think it's Alex. Your hand is up. Thank you, Andre. And I apologize for hogging the spotlight, but um, <laughs> I'm going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate tonight. Uh oh. Uh oh, <laughs> I'm going and and I'm looking at you, Kevin. But uh, it okay. Th this is a fantastic discussion, but it's very ops heavy. And I just want to remind everyone that we are DevOps, and Dev is the first word. We haven't heard much from the developers here, right? Now, and I go, I'm going back to what Willie said: is that uh, developers should not be fretting about piddly stuff. You know that. The infrastructure and and the, the refrigerators and the dishwashers and just focus on delivering features and, and functionality to the customer. However, my question to Kevin here, and I, I know you, we have we're running out, out of time. We can talk later, but we've both Kevin and I have noticed that for some reason developers have this propensity to leave security for the last. <laughs> and how do we? Uh, question for the group. How can we reverse that? Because in my mind, it should be the first. The first thing I want to do is get clearance from the security, and then I'm clear to go in and do my job. Not learning later in the game that Kevin comes in fuming. Uh, what, what does that accomplish? Nothing. And oh, so, it's, oh, yeah, actually, it's funny you mentioned. I totally forgot to include. There's this meme that was made at WorkSafe by Jens. I saw you in here, Jens. He made this meme where it's you know the the Batman slapping Robin, but it says Kevin said so. 
Um, and that you <laughs> ends up having to come up uh, exactly yeah. what you said, Alex. Like, I, I, no one wants me to come into their application, face red, steam coming in my ears, slapping people. No, no, I, in case HR is here, there's no slapping going on. Um, it's just a meme. But it, it goes in line with exactly what, what you want out. Like, it, it's how do we shift this early on? How do we shift left, truly shift left? Not just say we are, but how do we shift the security part left? Left. How do we raise awareness of this so much earlier? Because as you and I have talked about, Alex, like it is so much more expensive, difficult and complicated yeah. to fix a problem, kind of how it currently happens in a lot of places when it comes in late. How do we make this early on? And if you and I hadn't answered this question, we wouldn't be asking this. So you know, I... It's, it's a big question. Isn't that common sense? Like if I want to travel, first thing I want to do, I'm yes. going to open my passport, come down and check. When does it expire? I don't want to learn that at the airport after I spend $3,000. <laughs> right? I mean, first thing first. And that's my kind of um, frustration here. Like why, <laughs> how can we raise awareness? How can we uh, please ask people, please check security. Yeah. And then when you're clear, have fun, right? Yeah, I, that's that's something I'd be very interested in having more discussions about that because I don't have an answer to this. It's something I, yeah. I, I would like. I think to we should, because uh, this this has been ops heavy, which is great. And did, we can talk forever about ops, but I need dev side. Yeah. I want to have this kind of harmony and, and the, the infinity <laughs> loop. Anyway, thank you every, uh, very much, everyone. This has been so much fun tonight. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So um, it's a time to wrap up. And I am pretty sure there is more questions. Um, all of our speakers are on LinkedIn, so you can reach out to them, send the questions. I'm pretty sure they will be happy to answer. Um, in the meantime, we need to wrap up. And so many thanks to all four speakers today. Um, and thank you to, to the audience, everybody who participated today. Um, I know we are over time, um, but this was really, really fantastic conversation and discussion. Um, as always, if there is any topic that you like to talk to, um, please do not hesitate to contact me um, and we'll schedule you to present and participate in discussions in this, um, in this meetup or in this forum. So um, thank you very much again and have a great evening, everyone. Good night. Thanks very much, Thank everyone. You, Thank, everyone. You, Thank, you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.